feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Welcome back to another episode of The Shrimp Tank. We come to you virtually from Seattle and the entire PNW and the Pacific Northwest. We're finally out of snow. Spring has sprung. Everyone, if you want to learn how to start, grow, or run a successful business, this right here is the podcast for you. You are in the right place. It's where we say street smarts and book smarts collide. Hello again, everyone. I'm Dan Whedon, and my co-host today is Monica Blackwood. We're going to learn more, a little bit more about Monica in just a minute. <laughs> Our guest today is Dr. Aaron Lavelle from the Olympic Educational Services District number 114. Uh, Dr. Aaron Lavelle is the new superintendent of Olympic Educational Services, District 114, which is located in Bremerton, Washington. The OESD, as we lovingly call it, is one of nine regional educational agencies serving school districts of all types in the state of Washington. Uh, it's primarily functions as a regional support agency and delivers educational services that can be more efficiently or economically performed. Aaron is basically the CEO of a large organization. Welcome, Aaron. We'll be with you in a minute. Everyone, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. We're on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube. Aaron's going to like this word I use. We are ubiquitous. Maybe I'll make you spell it, Aaron. Just hang tight. Uh, we, we are ubiquitous. We come to you from about a dozen cities, including the mothership in Atlanta, Boston, Boca Raton, uh, Charleston, a whole bunch of great places. Now, before we bring on Aaron, Monica, hello and welcome back. Hi, Dan. It's so great to see you. Well, it's great to see you. And I mentioned uh, <laughs> beginnings. This is this is your second podcast as right? host. But the last one seems like an eternity away. It was in fe early February. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So we need we need people to know a little bit more about you, Monica. So before we jump into talking with Aaron, I thought I'd had just a couple quick plead the fifth type questions. And I, I, I think people will get to know you. You ready? <laughs> Put me on the spot. Okay, Monica, you get to travel yes. cross country in a car by yourself. No Clay, who's your husband, no children. You get to go by yourself. And and I, I slip you, because we're not using local technology, I slip you a CD. It's, it's an artist. I want to know who the artist is. And for bonus points, the name of the album. Who are you listening to all the way across country? Well, since you told me that I couldn't have, like, you said one artist and not, like, one of those mixtape CDs, you know, no mix. No, 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 one no artist, tape. one artist. No okay. Tape. I'll have to tell you that right now it would have to be George Jones because he's a shirt tail relative of mine. And I'm really trying to dig into a little bit of his history and, and learn a little bit more about that part of my family. So, um, so it'd have to be him might be the greatest hits CD. I don't know. Might be something else, but we'll see. George Jones was not, I know who he is. I had that was I didn't know he was a shirt tail relative, and that was not what I was expecting. Okay, I blew number you out two, of the water with that, didn't I? <laughs> you got you you stumped me with that one. Okay, number two, favorite all time favorite dessert. What you you get you get a choice after whatever meal you're having. This is your go to dessert. Okay, so it's a family recipe, and it's called potato cake, and it's a spice. It's called cake what? A spice cake. Okay. And it's a lot like um, carrot cake, but it's got a chocolate hint to it. And it's made with mashed potatoes and a bunch of other things. And then seven minute frosting on the top. So those who, who are in the, in the kitchen a lot baking, they know what seven minute frosting is. So uh, I think you're going to have to bring that to our first <laughs> ever shrimp tank podcast host uh, get together this summer. I, and then we'll listen to some George Jones at the same time. Sounds but we got to listen to some... We got to listen to Aaron Lavelle, Monica. Uh, I have <laughs> known, I have known Aaron uh, somewhere in the vicinity of about twelve or thirteen years now. I happened to be on the school board at North Kitsap when Aaron was there as an assistant superintendent. 
Uh, I cried the day he left to go back to Bremerton and, and then he went on to be a superintendent there. Aaron, welcome to the show. Uh, I want to talk to you about some new beginnings because you've taken a, a, a leap outside of what we normally see that uh, school leadership does. You've gone as high as you could go in school leadership. You are now basically the CEO of a business. Tell us about it. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Monica. Hello, Dan. Um, I'm, I'm curious, Dan, were those tears of joys when I uh, left North Kitsap? <laughs> no, no, I was very sad. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, well, um, two totally uh, different jobs, really. Uh, being a superintendent of a public school district is uh, it's an amazing job to have. Um, you know, you get to hone in on your local community, right? Uh, working with your parents, business partners, of course, district staff, and uh, just really honing in on, you know, what's best for, for that community, right, um, of students. Now, uh, shifting over to an ESD, um, I have responsibilities to an entire region that now include four counties in North Mason, Kitsap, Plow, and Jefferson counties, and an entire loop around the Olympic Mountains and out to the coast. And so um, shifting from leading an individual public school district to now being the support hub for services and training uh, for 15 school districts two tribal compact schools, a charter school, some private schools um, is really a totally different feat in itself. So it's been been a very interesting transition in my first eight months. Monica, you're up, Monica. I am. You are. You you got the next question for Aaron, I take it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> totally... <laughs> it's all good so um um tell me a little bit um hot or not question um uh the future of public schools in um a more volatile and demanding landscape well i mean the good news is there's always hope right in the future in our public schools um I think many would agree that our public systems need a lot of work. Uh, they need a lot of improvement. And while we did amazing things during the pandemic for nearly three years, um, it was pretty decimating in a lot of ways as well. So I think there's um, just a lot of things that school districts are, are having to deal with. Some of it new, um, some of it not so new. I think a lot of the things that that we're seeing now is just a lot of the social, emotional, mental health, anxiety issues that a lot of students um, are experiencing, uh, certainly before the pandemic, but I think it kind of enhanced that uh, moving forward. And then really just trying to uh, help students and meeting them where they're at. And, you know, what are their pathways going to be uh, post K-12 experiences? And I think the great news there is that our state is starting to recognize that and that a for your university track is not for every student. And so there's many opportunities now in the business world, um, trade schools that are um, highly endorsed now where you can leave high school and go right into you know, a career opportunity. So um, I think it's pretty exciting. So just so Aaron, a you know, I, 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 oh, go ahead, Sorry. Monica. Um, a follow-up question that I had um, kind of blending um, your intro and um, the answer to that question. Um, now that you're servicing um, this much larger geographical area, um, and you know you're you're in Bremerton primarily, and there are some of those um, districts that are are close by. Um, how is it that you're reaching out to uh, the the schools and the districts um, a little bit further away that still fall under your service area and meeting those needs of um, for you know, helping getting out of the pandemic and so forth? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, that's one that I still have to experience myself uh, being new here. But we have, you know, our furthest district away is up in Cape Flattery, Nia Bay area. Mm -hmm. And so through the ESD, uh, we have contracted services. And of course, with the service as a person. And so we have 250 employees here at the ESD and they are stationed all around the region. 
Some live in those areas, but um, some have multiple responsibilities to a lot of the rural districts. So they're on the road uh, constantly, depending on what that service is that um, they're providing. Um, so, so the long and the short of it is there is a lot of windshield time for people um, <laughs> who serve those districts within the ESD. Um, they are constantly moving and, and grooving. And for me, you know, uh, making this shift from one school district and one community, um, my goal uh, by the end of summer is to be immersed in each one of these communities um, and learning more about their cultures and what those needs really are. Um, it's hard to know how to be an entrepreneur with them if we don't understand um, where they're coming from and what their needs are because, um, you know, um, Port Angeles is different than Bremerton, which is different than, you know, Forks, right? And so sure. the communities, the careers, um, the economic um, boons are just different. So, <clears throat> so, so Aaron, that, that brings me to, to, you know, just to a question then. I know that I didn't have a clue as a parent or as a community member what a what an uh, you know what an uh, what an ESD was. Yeah. I, I'd never heard of it until I became a school board member. To, to the person who might be listening to this, uh, maybe they have kids in school. Uh, maybe they had kids in school. What are those services? What is it that you as as an ESD provide to these school districts? Well, what's interesting, uh, Dan, is that between the nine ESDs, many of the services are very similar and some are exactly the same. And then depending on the region and what those needs are, they're vastly different. Um, so in, in our ESD, um, gosh, there's hundreds of services that we provide, but we have um, early learning childhood programs. Um, we have special education teachers that we contract out around the region where there are none. Um, they have a difficult time finding specific job um, alike personnel. We have school nurse corps. We have uh, safety um, and security centers here. Um, but a lot of it too is just we provide IT support, uh, networking support. We provide all the business and financials for um, about half of the districts in our region. Um, and then even for all of the districts, we're responsible for reviewing their budgets and all their submissions to the state, um, you know, before they, they go into OSPI. So, I mean, at the risk of leaving, you know, most of them out, there's just so many different types of things um, that we can provide. Um, and lots of times, too, you know, in my role, um, I'm a phone a friend, right? Uh, superintendents. <laughs> I love that. Folks kind of have an issue, you know, um, when Greg Lynch was superintendent here, we would call Greg, hey, there's this, you know, situation. Um, so certainly not legal advice, but just, you know, a, a bouncer, right? Um, sure. Ideas and stuff. So, um, but the services are, they're, they're vast. Um, yeah. We, we can do anything. We provide professional development, you know, all kinds of trainings on site or in the districts. I mean, our attitude is uh, tell us what you need or what you want, and we're going to try yeah. and make it happen um, at, at a better fee than what you might get from a consultancy agency from across the nation, perhaps. So, right. That's fantastic, Aaron. And, you know, um, because my my parents were in education, I have been familiar with OESD for um, a number of years. However, I, I learned something new. Um, you actually provide um, some staffing to organizations for the, um, you know, the the areas that can't, like yes. you said, recruit um, special education teachers and and right. and so forth. So I didn't realize that part of it, and that's super cool. And given that I'm in HR, I'm now going to ask you how how <laughs> is it that you are able to recruit for those positions? <laughs> are you successful? Yeah, well, uh, we are. We are successful. Um, you know, in, in this day and age, I mean, you have to be competitive. So, you know, we offer competitive salaries in the different positions. Um, and then one thing, you know, that's a little different in an ESD than perhaps a public school system is there, there's flexibility um, in these jobs and there kind of has to be. So, um, you know, there's opportunities for some remote work. 
Um, there's also opportunities for being on the road and working with, you know, the different districts so that no, no day is ever the same. There's not an office or the same classroom you're reporting to, you know, you could be in a different environment three different times a week, uh, you know, which is attractive for some people. So it's, it's just something different. Um, what I do know, though, about uh, folks that choose to serve in an ESD is that they, um, they become very attached uh, to those communities. And I would say particularly maybe someone in the rural communities, um, they just fall in love, you know, with those communities and those students and the services that providing. And they also recognize that if it's not them, I mean, who is it? Right. Um, so there is a high level of importance in that willingness to, to, to serve through an ESD. And ours is very rural. We're the most rural ESD in the state. So, wow. All right. You know, it's amazing how quick time flies. Aaron, we got to pay some bills here. We're going to take a, our first okay. short break today for, for to, to hear from today's spotlight sponsor. And when we come back with our guest, Dr. Aaron Lavelle, for a hot or not section of the show, we're going to find out what Aaron thinks about having a business plan. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the shrimp tank. Do you know where great people go to meet great companies? West Sound Workforce. For 25 years, West Sound Workforce has been putting people to work, matching their skills and interests with positions employers are looking to fill right here in our own communities. Specializing in temp, temp to hire, and direct hire placement services, West Sound Workforce is there to help job seekers looking to find their next position or their next career step with no cost. Companies partner with partners. Boy, I'm gonna have to spit that out a little bit better. Companies partner with West Sound Workforce to augment their recruitment strategies, whether to cover the shift of a vacation employee of their own, having extra hands to make a special project happen, or searching for their new team member. Visit our website at westsoundworkforce.com or check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And welcome back to the Shrimp Tank, where we interview the best and brightest CEOs and business leaders throughout the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. I almost said peninsula because, you know, we've been talking a lot about the <laughs> peninsula. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Monica Blackwood, and our guest today is Aaron Lavelle for our next segment, Hot or Not. Aaron, I promise not to give you any tw tongue twisters. I see I'm still having trouble with that. It must be we, one of those days. We Aaron, can help you, probably, you with that. I know you've listened to the show. Uh, you know that we're going to uh, pepper you. Monica and I are going to pepper you with questions about business, about life, uh, maybe about your golf game. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe Oof. we'll leave that one to plead the fifth. But uh, are you going to tell us whether it's hot or not? Why or why not? Uh, I talk about business plans, and I, I think there's a common misconception that uh, those in schools, uh, they're not really businesses, right? They're, they're, they're not, you know, really running like a business. So I'm going to ask you, in your position, at least with the ESD, is having a business plan hot or not? Well, Dan, I'm going to go with hot. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I door well, number one yeah, is hot. Yeah, yeah, I think it's hot. And actually, I would say that for a public school system as well. I mean, we have um, millions of dollars in our budget, right? So uh, in the Bremerton School District, our budget was, you know, over $100 million here at the ESD. We're operating on a $26 million budget um, coming from many different revenue sources and plenty of expenditures. So yes, we want to start with the end in mind, where we want to be, where we want to end up, where we think we're going. Uh, and of course, work that back. Uh, but absolutely, you have to have, you got to have a business plan and, you know, goals that keep us accountable. So. All right, here's one for you. Hot or not, snow days still exist in in schools during the winter time. Uh, <laughs> that's a, that's, it's hot uh, and not for me. So um, it's, yes, it's hot. And I feel for all of my colleagues who still have to get up at 2.30 drive the roads, make a decision by five, and then literally be split 50-50 on whether people are happy about it or not. Uh, of course, most kids are. Right. Uh, here at the ESD, our only worry is, you know, we have folks that, you know, travel all around. They just kind of follow whatever that district is doing. And for us here, I um, mean, if the snow's fallen, you know, thankfully we have the opportunity to work remotely if needed. So, but um, 
there's a little bit of me that misses the snow days just because I was one that did get up and drive and I kind of enjoyed that. But <laughs> overall, I'm glad the stress of that isn't isn't there anymore. Well, Aaron, my next quite my next hot or not, I, I, you you actually made a comment about, so I, I'm probably giving you an easy one, but I, I still like, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Hot or not, vocational training for those whose next path isn't college or the military. Yeah, I think it's hot. Um, I think that there's been huge paradigm shifts in how we think about um, students. And I think that it has shifted from what the adults in this world think they should be doing to what they want and what they should be doing with, with their career path and their life. Um, of course, <laughs> we still need to guide them and advise them. But, you know, I think there are a lot of corporations, a lot of companies, there's just a lot of opportunities right now that are paying um, high salaries or, you know, decent living wage salaries with benefits. And if it's a position that you know you're going to end up in someday, I, you know, I just don't think you have to engage in a two or four year college education. That being said, that would be beneficial for every person to go through that, um, I yeah. think on some level. But um, I also know there are companies out there. I just read IBM last week came out and said, hey, we want to take students straight out of high school. We have our own training program for them and they're going to make 65 grand in their first year. I mean, yeah. what do you tell a student? So. Yeah, so Aaron, you know, when I was in the school board and you were you were uh, there at, at uh, the same school, the same school district I was at, uh, I actually often felt that there was a, a kind of an un, it wasn't meant to be this way, but an unjust pressure put on kids by parents. Uh, and I may have been guilty myself of that at one point of, hey, you got to you got to get grades, go to college because that's where you're going to get a, jo a job. And and really what's happened in those 10 years since even more with the development of technology and with uh, virtual and hybrid working and even entrepreneurship opportunities. Uh, that's not the, the quickest and, and maybe uh, probably a more expensive path. So is there anything that you as, a, as a, an ESD can do to help those kids or the teachers who are teaching those types of careers? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we we enter that arena on on different levels. Um, and, and I do want to say, you know, I think that every student, there's such high value in a public education. And um, whether a student's going to go on to college or go into a career or just even a job, if they're not sure exactly what they are wanting to do, uh, right, um, professionally, um, there's a high value in a K-12 in a K-12 education. And I think, you know, in our United States, it's, it's one of the best around. Um, the ESD can help on lots of levels, but there are also skill centers and we have one, we actually share a parking lot with West Sound yep. Technical Skill right. Center next door. Um, we see different types of partnerships. We're involved in career connected learning work, uh, which was one of the governor's, you know, initiatives a, a few years back. And so we help coordinate and facilitate those programs and, um, and apprenticeships. So we have a little role to play and some of it is facilitation and assisting with districts, but absolutely. So kind of going along um, those lines and, and I'm pretty sure I know how you're gonna answer with the hot or not, but um, employer and company involvement in middle school and high school um, education and, and where my interest really is, is how how would you like to see companies and employers get involved a little bit more? Well, I'd love to see it, you know, up front and center on the stage. And I think where district struggle is just it's a it's a it's kind of a juggling game in a sense, right? Um, how with with so little time, how do you achieve it all and get it all? But um, I know that districts have have worked really hard. We have partnerships. Um, not only through ESDs, but, you know, through West Sound STEM, Washington STEM, we have Graduate Strong here locally, Kitsap Strong, all of the different community partnerships that that come to the table uh, and they help and they they help um, highlight and showcase the different opportunities, whether they're here nationally or globally. And so it's up to the students to take advantage of those opportunities when they're presented to them. And so I think that's kind of some of our work too, is, is that motivational piece, um, 
when sometimes they don't maybe have that self-recognition of that yet, whether it be middle school or early on in high school. Sure. So how how might employers and companies help you motivate employees? It's like, you know, how 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 to make the trades really, you know, exciting and sexy, how to make um, you know, uh culinary arts exciting and sexy, how to make anything, you know, yeah. exciting. I think it's the opportunity. Invite them to come job shadow. Invite them to come, you know, have a paid or an unpaid type of an internship or an apprenticeship. Um, the schools can help get the word out, right? And you can do career days and career fairs. And we still do all of those things. And imagine you, you know, where are you going? Um, there are still work that's done in the schools that help students identify what their strengths are and maybe what, <laughs> you know, where they wouldn't be. Right. Um, and so then once those are identified, it's just a matter of schools reaching out, ESDs, skill centers reaching out, knowing what the industry needs and who the partners are and having them come in and providing an opportunity. I mean, a student, something might look good on paper, but if they live that for a couple of weeks through an experience, they either may love it more or they might go, eh, that's not what I thought that was. I think I'm going to go a different direction. I mean... I see that every day in my life. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. And I guess I would go back to a Brene Brown quote, and that is, and I've used it for, for years because it's true, we can't do it alone. We were never meant to, right? So it's like we 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 heavily rely on our communities and our business partners in our community. I mean, can't do it alone. So so Aaron, you know, I'm I'm I, I'm actually celebrating my 40th high school uh, reunion this year. It's hard uh -huh. to believe that I was in high school uh, over four decades ago, and and you know when I was in school back in the in high school in the early 80s, the way you became a boss, the way you became a business owner was you ended up having to get a job somewhere first. It was that was just the way of the world. You got a job. And so schools kind of sent you in that direction. You got a job. Then eventually, unless you were taking over the family business, you still, you know, today that landscape's completely changed. You you don't have to uh, get, you know, there's smart kids who who have the ability to, to go figure something out even from the beginning or at least early on. Is there a place or is there going to be a place or is it growing at all? The whole concept of entrepreneurship being taught in schools. Yeah, I mean, I really do believe that is happening in schools. I would I would say that it is probably more so in the career technical education world, you know, in the high schools and the middle school. Um, and those offerings have vastly increased, right, in the last decade. And so there's a lot of exposure there. And again, I think there's just more opportunities. You see a lot of um, very specified high schools. There's aviation schools. There's you know STEM schools. There's just a lot of different uh, opportunities there that you know ten years ago was just still more traditional. And so it is being um, encouraged. And as an ESD, it, it's there's um, very much so a connection there. I mean, we we have to be entrepreneurial here, or we go out of business, right? And so you know our goal is to find ways to be relevant and needed and wanted and you know how can we come on the scene and make sure that the students in all of their communities and the staff are getting what they need um, so if we're not being a role model in that then we haven't done our job either so i think it's it all lines up systemically for sure sure um aaron you talk about um needing to be entrepreneurial and and flexible and kind of a little on the innovation cutting edge side of things um, so hot or not question online and virtual schooling um, for students. And um, what do you think about that? Where do you think it's going um, mm -hmm. now that we've come out of COVID? Well, I think it's hot. And I think it's hot in a sense that maybe prior to COVID, there was always online learning programs in the state. There was a few, few of them and uh, many districts took on their own initiative with online learning, but there were a lot of rules and there were a lot of things you had to follow with the state um, to legitimize that experience for students. Mm -hmm. And there was always this fear of a faceless education um, and the role of an education system with teachers in front of you and principals. So um, definitely COVID opened that door. We all learned right away 
I'm not sure most people knew what Zoom was or Teams or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, we were thankful that um, during COVID, I was in Breverton schools and we had had this gift from our community on a levy, tech levy, and we had devices for all of our students. If we hadn't had that, I'm not sure what we would have done, you know, uh, during that time. So um, what we've seen is enrollments have changed uh, overall in our state. There have been some drop in in-person enrollment. Uh, there has been an increase in online enrollment uh, in, in certain regions in our state. So I, I think it's, again, it's another pathway and it's, um, it's an attempt to meet students where they're at and where they're comfortable and where their skills are. And quite frankly, not uh, everyone is cut out for comprehensive middle schools, high schools, you know, big elementary schools. And I think through COVID, a lot of parents are now working from home. Uh, their jobs have shifted remotely and they're enjoying having their children at home and doing homeschooling and being able to monitor their, their children's um, education firsthand. So is that a bad thing? I don't, I don't think so. But it's certainly not the majority. You know, it's a small percentage of students that are doing that. So, right. Well, where we are at right now is a time to take our second commercial break. We're going to take that short break to hear from our corporate sponsors. And when we come back with our guest, Dr. Aaron Lavelle, for our famous plea, the fifth section of the show, uh, we are going to find out what the most challenging and unusual part of Aaron's new job is. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the Shrimp Tank. And Plead the Fifth is brought to you by our corporate sponsors, Ideal Life 360, Cornerstone Financial, First Underwriters Insurance, BC Fitness Studio, and Upstart Group. Please visit our website at www.shrimptankpodcast.com slash Seattle to learn more about these terrific companies. Now back to the show. Welcome back to the Shrimp Tank, where we interview the best and brightest CEOs and business lead, business thought leaders in the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. I'm co-host Monica Blackwood. Our guest today is Aaron Lavelle. For our next segment, Plead the Fifth. All right, Aaron, we're going to put you on the hot seat. Uh, okay. You are going to get some tougher questions. You can plead the fifth, but you can only plead the fifth once, and then we're, we'll pull out the big guns. Right. So, you know, I, I know that in any transition, no matter what it is, we, we always go into something and we learn something new. And it's like, oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> that, I didn't expect that at all. I mean, and, and sometimes there's more than one, but more than one. But in this transition that you make, uh, plead the fifth, Aaron, what's been that big, the biggest, oh, I didn't see that coming uh, part of your job? Well, I'm not sure that I can plead the fifth right off the bat. Though. Um, <laughs> I think honestly, Dan, it's, it, it was a mind shift for me from, you know, I my previous experience from the time I was, you know, 22 years old has been in a public school system, right? And the last 10 running one. Um, and so I think the biggest shift is while school districts certainly have a business component to them, as I mentioned earlier, the ESD, it, it is a business. I mean, this this is, um, you know, we have fees for services. Yes, we have grants and cooperatives and we have some provisos from the state, minimal core funding. Um, it's having to learn how to think like a CEO versus a school superintendent. So as a school superintendent, you know, I'm always researching school trends and, you know, what's gonna be best for our students and our community and things like that. And now um, I'm having to, not only learn a new a new job, which I haven't had in a decade, but also, <laughs> you know, thinking business smarts, business wise, um, um, opportunities, jobs, you know, come and go within the ESD based on the industry, based on what districts need, and so I think it's that it's that planning component, and, and the budgeting and the, all the systems are they're not similar. Everything is is different, so. The learning curve for me is just every time I think I have it figured out and <laughs> then I go, oh, nope, we don't do it like that. That's not how it is. And um, and, and as challenging as that is, it's actually really exciting because it's different. So I am thinking of myself as just kind of a multi-headed leader in a sense where we still have that educational component. That's what drives us is the students in our region, but um, but it's different. 
um, because we're interacting with them on a business level. Um, so, okay. So, um, uh, putting my parent educational hat on really quick and thinking about OESD, um, Destination Imagination is a program that you're familiar with. I <laughs> yes. <know> it. <laughs> I think um, I'm in a few pictures. Right. <laughs> I do have you. Um, of the skills developed in that program, which is the one that most effectively augments slash complements slash rounds out um, what students can learn in school and how can the OESD help bolster that? <laughs> so, so thinking about in the context of DI, I mean, particularly in the last five years, they've had a really um, hands-on focus with STEM, yeah. um, science, technology, engineering, and math. And so it's also coupled with the student's creativity. So there's not directions on this is how you're going to get there. Okay. It's you need to self-discover. You have to learn how to work with a team, uh, right? You have these business type skills and figuring sure. out a plan in order to achieve that goal. So when I think about how that correlates with the ESD, that's exactly what we do here. And that's what we try to do to assist our school districts in our region. So um, I think it's programs like DI that uh, almost in a sense, I wish more students had exposure to that because I think it's a real confidence builder when you learn how to do things individually and also as a team. Uh, there's sure. not many jobs out there, careers where you're not, you know, you're going to be by yourself. I mean, right. you have to have those skills um, that employers are looking for. So not to mention the instant challenge where you have to figure out everything on the fly, which is a good skill to learn. <laughs> it is. And I've had many of those challenges in my day, <laughs> uh, you know. I, th I think they say uh, an average day of decision making for a superintendent is 350 to 400 decisions a day. So whether it's just the yes, no, maybe so's or the thought out ones, there's a <laughs> lot of them in, in a day. And some of them are emergent like that. Right. You know, schools, especially public schools, touch everybody at some point and they can be targets of criticism or praise and, and everything in between. Uh Having spent so long in the public school system and now transitioning into this role, which services public schools, um, plead the fifth. What, what do you like least and what do you like most about the public school industry today? Um, what I love the best is I still believe in the system, even though it's, it has its flaws. Um, I believe it's the it's it's the way that we can meet students and remove a lot of barriers for them and their family in order for them to achieve achieve their goals and their successes in life and, and what they want to do. I think one of the things that's just becoming increasingly um, frustrating is that public school systems, not just here regionally, Washington or in the United States, have become the hotbed platform for every social construct that's being debated in America today. And if you look at um, School board meetings. I mean, Dan, there were there were some good ones and some tougher ones when we were together. But <laughs> yep. I mean, right now it's it can be brutal, and everyone yeah. you know has um, a differing opinion about almost everything, and they're playing out in the school systems. One thing though that I think is is a has been a really good thing to see is the student voice is stronger now than I think than it is ever has been. I mean, students are are activating that voice from within and they're letting the adults know what they need and what they want and what they think. And that's a wonderful thing uh, for our for our young learners and our school systems. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. One quick question and I, it just came to mind. So Monica, I'm sorry for, for uh, bumping you. Uh, so you have your question after and please ask it later. But I, I have this question. One of the challenges I saw in, 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 in being a school board member was funding. And, you know, back in the day, back in the old days, it made, you know, it seemed to make sense. Uh, your property taxes paid for schools with the volatility in different areas uh, where everybody can be different. Different communities can have different size of, of property and taxes and all of that. Uh, the what I see is the inconsistency and I think the absolute fear of school districts come around funding. 
Is there a better way? Plead the fifth. Is there a better way in the future to fund schools so that there's more certainty for administrators, uh, more certainty for board members, and more equity for districts, regardless of where they are? Yeah, I would say that I'm not sure there's a better way. Um, I think what we need to have is our state and our legislators truly have education be the paramount duty of the state and of its budget. And right now it's at 41% of the state budget, I believe. Um, so if the money is there, they have to reprioritize that. There are, is, to your point, there are many communities that levies don't pass, bonds don't pass. So the additional enrichment funds aren't there. Um, I just listened yesterday to the Supreme Court case, uh, Wakayakum School District versus State of Washington. They have dilapidated buildings in a small rural community. They can't pass a levy. They can't pass a bond. Um, the building is, I don't know how old it is, but it's way old. Um, what's their option? What do they do? Um, and so is capital facilities a part of, should that be a part of the McCleary case that said this is a paramount duty? So you have the academic side, and now they're talking about the capital facility side. You know, what type of education is a student going to get in a building that's 100 years old and isn't safe? So I guess, I guess, you know, there's a funding model, Dan, that's in place, and it does not adequately fund public education. I mean, it just doesn't. Um, so the funding model has to change in the way that it's allocated. Um, it's, the, it's called the prototypical state funding model. And I could give you many examples of how it's failed. <laughs> so Aaron, <laughs> you are the front face of OESD and thank you so much for spending so much time talking to us about um, the future of education uh, really in our state um, and in our area, but you are also a person in our community. So I wanna know a little <laughs> bit more about you. Um, here's my question, plead the fifth, or not. Um, if you could start another business from a hobby you have, what would it be? Um, let's see. <laughs> I would probably open up Dan Whedon's School of Golf lessons. <laughs> <laughs> because I need a whole bunch of them. And I I love, love to play golf. It's a good hobby. And um, I'm terrible. So yeah, I would love to uh, do something like that. It's actually really fun, but it's also very frustrating. So, But the fresh air is always good. Fresh air is always good, although it's been a little rough this winter. So <laughs> That is true. <laughs> very good. Well, Aaron, thank you so much um, for being a guest here on the Shrimp Tank. For our listeners that want to get in touch with you and learn more about OESD 114, how can they get more information? Sure. Well, we have a website and folks can reach us at www.oesd114.org um, or just, yeah, just look us up. We're on the internet. Sounds great. Um, make sure to check out all the replays of Shrimp Tank or on shrimptankpodcast.com slash Seattle and wherever you get your podcast, iHeart, Apple, Google, Spotify, any of those places that you like to listen. Please follow us on our show's social media pages on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Well, Aaron, thank you very much for uh, for coming on. I knew when we had coffee a couple of weeks ago that you would be a great guest, and uh, you certainly were. Thank you. Monica, again, welcome to the team. I may have another uh, couple plead the fist for you next time, but uh, uh, so you'll, I'll have you ready. But no, thank you very much. It was great to have you both here. Everyone, our next show is actually two weeks away. Uh, Michelle Bomberger is going to be my co-host. She's traveling next week. But since we have five Wednesdays in March, we're, we're bumping into then. I'm going to think of something to come up with next week uh, just for fun. But our next real show will be Wednesday, March 29th. Our guest will be Rodrigo Frias from the Classic Nursery and Landscaping. And again, Michelle Baumberger will be here joining me. In the meantime, though, please be safe, be well, and be prosperous. Because until next week, the shrimp is back in the tank. So long. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small fish.